This Stealing the Mind Bible Conference presentation is by Andy Woods and is entitled One Second After Rapture. For a free catalog of over 250 awesome Bible studies on DVD or CD, call Compass at 800-977-2177 or on the web at compass.org. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. If we could take our Bibles and open them to the book of 1 Thessalonians. Book of uh, 1 Thessalonians. How's the mic doing? Okay. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse uh, 14. Um, the title of this uh, first session is One Second After the Rapture. And I love uh, talking about the rapture because I was thinking about it the other day. There's not a single problem in my life that wouldn't be fixed with the rapture. <laughs> so come Lord Jesus, amen? Amen. Well, I've given some talks here on the rapture, so we're not going to be defining the rapture, but uh, we're going to talk a little bit about an angle that I hadn't really thought of before, and that's what happens one second after the rapture. So let's uh, break this down. What's going to happen, number one, for the believer? What's going to happen, number two, for the unbeliever? And then number three, so what? Why does it matter? How does this affect our lives? First of all, for the believer, I've got some, some good news for you. Uh, there are three really good things that are going to happen should the rapture occur today. The first is a reunion. Notice, if you will, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 14 Paul says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Verse 17, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Uh, we just had a very good friend of mine in our church, pass away. And uh, there's always that sadness that you feel when a believer passes away. But if this verse is accurate, and it is, what Paul is saying is that deceased loved one in Christ that you know, you're going to be reunited with them at the point of the rapture. Because they are currently in the presence of the Lord coming down. And we who are alive and remain on the earth at the time are caught up for a giant reunion in the sky. And think of seeing deceased parents, deceased friends in Christ in a second. And that's what we have to look forward to at the point of the rapture. Something else really good is going to happen to you. Take a look at 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 51. There is going to be a resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed. Now, you might want to put that verse on your nursery at the church. <laughs> in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, I had someone say to me the other day, I know we're in the end times. And I say, how do you know that? Well, it says the last trump. Well, it's probably not the best way to interpret the Bible. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. In a nanosecond, you are placed in a resurrected body. It's still you. But you're going to look a lot better, and I'm going to look a lot better. It's the body that God intended for us to have before sin entered the world. 
How many of you know that sin has contaminated and wrecked our bodies? Genesis 3, verse 19, right after the fall of man, God says, For dust you are, to dust you show what? Return. Paul in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 16 says that the outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. If you don't believe these verses, I'll prove it to you. When you get home uh, this evening, break out your high school yearbook <laughs> and compare it to your modern driver's license picture, and you'll see changes going on in your body. We're deteriorating. But at the point of the rapture, we're placed in bodies which are imperishable. And something else that a lot of Christians are really not aware of is we will be ushered immediately into judgment. Now let me define judgment. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 says, For we must all, all means all, right? Christians, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. For what? For our performance appraisals. Not to judge sin. Not to determine our salvation. Because you see, at the very point that you place personal faith in Christ, Jesus has made us a promise. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has, present tense, eternal life, and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. So what's this judgment for then? It's rewards. Either rewards will be given or not given. These are, this is not a heaven or hell issue. But rewards will be given or not given at what is called the Bema Seat Judgment of Christ based on how we allow the Lord to use our lives this side of eternity. And in fact, five crowns will be bestowed or not bestowed. There's the incorruptible crown for gaining mastery over the old man. Now, the old man is not your dad. It's a sin nature. Crown of rejoicing for the soul winner. Crown of life for the believer that endures trials. Anybody going through trials today? There's a reward for that. A crown of glory for faithfully shepherding God's people. And then a crown of righteousness for longing for his appearing. This life ends in judgment, not just for the unbeliever, but also the believer. So that's the good news. But what in the world is going to happen for the unbeliever at the point of the rapture? What is going to happen to those who are, to quote uh, Tim LaHaye a little bit here, left behind? What is their fate? Let me give you about eight things that come to my mind. Number one, there's going to be a perverted explanation the world system is going to come up with some sort of explanation for all of these missing people. And we look at that and we say, that how can they explain that? And the fact of the matter is we're already being conditioned for that kind of explanation. An interesting book uh, by a non-believer is written by Barbara Max Hubbard. The book is called Revelation. And she's basically dictating what her spirit guide, she's a new ager, what her spirit guide told her. I believe her spirit guide is a demon. And I believe that her spirit guide is revealing to her the explanation that the world will give after the rapture. Notice what this spirit guide told her. Your unfinished species is ready to evolve. The time has come on earth for this quantum change to occur. Many of you, in many of you, her Christ further informed her that I cannot return until enough of you are attracted and linked. Hubbard's Christ explained, I did, not intend, I, I, I did not intend for you to deify me, but to deify yourselves as being at the same stage of evolution as I am. Suffice it is to say that if you do not choose to evolve into a wholesome, cooperative uh, human community, then you shall not. So a quantum leap in evolution is about to occur. Some will evolve, some will not. Well, what about those that don't evolve? The spirit guide goes on and it's, he says, the fundamental regression is self-centeredness, 
or the illusion that you are separated from God, I make war on self-centeredness. Furthermore, at the co-creative stage of evolution, one self-centered soul is like a lethal cancer in a body, deadly to itself and the whole. Thus the surgeon dare leave no cancer in the body when he closes up the wound after a delicate operation. We dare leave no self-centered person on earth after the selection process. Who is going to be surgically removed from the earth? The resistors. The right-wing fundamentalists. The Bible believers. Because these are people that simply would not cooperate with this quantum evolutionary leap into the new world order. And I think the perverted explanation will be something along those lines. In fact, a New Ager Randolph Price says that his spirit guide has informed him that nature will soon enter her cleansing cycle during which those of lower vibratory rates will be purified off the planet. And think uh, for a minute if a man like the Antichrist arises on the scene and brings order to confusion by giving some kind of spiritual explanation to all of the missing people. How he could bring order from a chaotic situation and that could catapult him into his role as leader of the fallen world. Some kind of perverted explanation will be offered. What else is going to happen? Well, there's going to be a dramatic, one second after the rapture, a dramatic change in God's program. From the church back to the nation of Israel. You see, God has had his hand on the church for the last 2,000 years. He has been using the church to fulfill the Great Commission where we are to go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Sadly, the great commission has become the great omission in many churches. But that is our task and that is our function. That is what God wants to do with the church. But you see, Romans 11 verse 25 says this, a partial hardening has happened in Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. At some point, the body of Christ will be complete. A number will be reached that only God knows. And at that point, the church will be removed from the earth through the rapture. And then what does God do? He begins to work once again through the nation of Israel. Because you see, God has made certain promises to the nation of Israel that he can never go back on. And when you study these promises very carefully, what you'll discover is that they are unconditional and unfulfilled. That lighter area there is all the land that was promised to Israel. That darker area is what the Joshua generation got. Obviously, Israel's program has not yet been completed. And you see, God cannot and will not forget the nation of Israel. In fact, if you want to get rid of the nation of Israel, here's how you do it. Jeremiah 31, verses 35 and 36. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day, and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel shall cease from being a nation before me forever. How do you get rid of Israel? You get rid of the sun, the moon, and the stars. Because God says as long as that fixed order exists, Israel will exist. And God has a glorious future for Israel following the rapture of the church. God at, the, at that time will reach the world through the 144,000 Jewish evangelists. Descending from the 12 tribes of Israel, not a Southern Baptist mentioned in that group <laughs> at all. And then he'll reach the world through the two Jewish witnesses. 
Now, these 144,000 Jewish evangelists that are described in Revelation 7 are described as the first fruits. Revelation 14 and verse 4 calls them the first fruits. In other words, God is going to use them to not only reach the world, but the rest of the nation of Israel. God is going to put so much pressure on Israel that Israel will be saved. Jeremiah 30 and verse 7 says, A time is coming called a time of Jacob's distress, but he, that's Israel, will be saved out of it. Romans 11 and verse 26 says, All Israel will be saved. So you have a radical change happening in the outworking of God's program. And there's even an outworking in God's program with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is doing something unique today that he has not done in ages past. Jesus said this in the upper room in John 16, verse 7. I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus told the disciples huddled in the upper room, I must leave so that the Holy Spirit can come. And what you discover as you go through the Bible is the Holy Spirit is doing things today that he's never done before in prior ages. For example, in the Old Testament age, a lot of people were saved first and got the Holy Spirit at a later point. That's not true in our age. We receive the Spirit of God at the point of faith in Christ. Romans 8 9 says that. In the Old Testament age, the Holy Spirit could come upon people and leave. Not true in our age. The Spirit is in us forever, John 14, 16 says. As far as I can tell, in the Old Testament age, not everyone was indwelt by the Spirit of God that was a believer. But in our age, every child of God is indwelt by the Spirit. And we could go on and on talking about this, but the Spirit of God started doing some radical things he's never done before once the church was born. But you see, once the church is removed... Then the meter goes back in a certain sense to how it was in the Old Testament age. The Spirit is still very much at work, but the enjoyment that we as God's people have with the Spirit is placed in more of a limited sense to how it was in Old Testament times following the rapture of the church. See, big changes are coming after the rapture in God's work with the church and also in God's work with the Holy Spirit. And something else that will happen one second after the rapture is the identification of the Antichrist. People will know exactly who the Antichrist is. Why is that? 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 6 and 7 says, And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who restrains him will do so until he is taken out of the way. The Antichrist cannot come to power right now. Why is that? Because something is restraining him and preventing him from coming to power. In prior teachings I've done here, I've tried to explain why that restrainer is the work of the Spirit through the church. This is why the Christian world is hated. Because the Christian world and the church's presence on the earth is inhibiting the Antichrist from coming to power but once the church is gone, that restraint is left and the Antichrist will come forward. And I believe this, Satan has always had a man waiting in the wings. Why is that? Because Ezekiel 28 verse 15 tells us that Satan was a created being. He is not all-knowing. He does not know when the rapture will occur, so he has always had somebody waiting in the wings. Once the rapture occurs, that Antichrist will come forward. That's why there are so many people in our world that look an awful lot like the Antichrist. <laughs> when I first got saved, people said, uh, who did you vote for in the presidential election? And I said, Ronald Reagan. They said, you just voted for the Antichrist. I said, why? Well, Ronald has six letters in it. Wilson has six letters in it. Reagan has six letters in it. 
And then Saddam Hussein came and went, and people said he was the Antichrist. Gorbachev came and went. He's the Antichrist. Then came along Bill Clinton. <laughs> and by that time, I knew enough of the Bible. I said, he is not the Antichrist. People said, why do you think that? Well, Daniel 11 says he will not be a lover of women. <laughs> so that, I ruled him out. But there have always been people that you say, that would, they, they would be a terrific antichrist. And then you look at Barack Obama. It's almost like the guy is running for antichrist or something. <laughs> So whoever the Antichrist is, we will know that we will have the best seats in the house, but the world will know exactly who he is once the restrainer is removed. There is a great mystery, it's really not a mystery, in something called 666 that's mentioned in Revelation 13, verse 18. It's the number of the beast. And what I think that means is it's related to something called gematria. Gematria is the idea that ancient languages, like Hebrew and Greek, the Bible in the New Testament being written in Greek, had a number attached to each letter. And so what you can do is you could take someone's name and spell it out in Greek and attach the right number to the right name and then add up the sum of the letters and everybody's name could be converted to a specific number. So whoever the Antichrist is, you'll be able to take his name, convert it into Greek, use the right gematria, and you'll, the world will know exactly who it is because his name will total 666. And one night I was asleep in bed and I woke up and my wife says, uh, what's wrong? I said, I'm nervous. She says, what are you nervous about? I go, how do I know I'm not the Antichrist? So I went downstairs, I pulled out this table, I spelled out my name in Greek, and fortunately I did not come out to 666, so I went right back to sleep. But you see, there is someone coming that will fit this exact paradigm, and the world will know exactly who he is. And then what will be ushered in is global government. Take a look at Zechariah 5, verses 5 through 11. This is a very forgotten passage of scripture. It says this, the angel who was speaking to me went with me and said to me, lift up your eyes. And I said, what is this going forth? And I said, what is it? And he said, this is the ephah going forth. And he said, this is their appearance in all the land. And behold, a lead cover was lifted up. And this is a woman sitting inside the ephah. Then he said to me, this is wickedness, and he threw her down to the middle of the ephah and cast the lead weight on its opening. Then I lifted up my eyes and I looked, and there two women were coming out of the wind in their wings, and they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heavens. And I said to the angel who was speaking to me, where are they taking the ephah? And they said to me, to, to build a temple in the land of Shinar, when it was prepared, she will be set there on her own pedestal. We have a woman named Wickedness put inside an ephah, which is a basket, and a piece of lead, or lead is placed over the lid, so she's trapped in there. And what this prophecy says is at the right time, she's going to be let loose. And she's going to return to a land called Shinar. You say Shinar. I've read about that before. I know that's where the Tower of Babel once stood, the land of Shinar. That area that we call Mesopotamia in between the Euphrates and the Tigris, modern day Iraq. It's where the children of Israel were taken into captivity. So one day this woman will go forth from this basket at the right time and she will return to that ancient area where Nimrod sought to build the Tower of Babel. And there a house or a temple will be built for her. It's a tremendous passage on the coming one world government a reincarnation of the Tower of Babel or Babel to be executed at just the right time when the woman is let out of the basket. I believe she's let out of the basket once the restrainer is gone. There's nothing left to inhibit world government. 
and it comes back to life. In fact, when you study this woman in Zechariah 5, you'll notice she seems to be described very similarly to the harlot in Revelation 17. I know Bible scholars differ on this, but that's the best take I have. And world government is coming back. It's described in Revelation 13, verses 16 through 18, where no man whether they're rich, poor, free slave, can buy or sell unless they receive the mark of the beast. And you see, we're already being conditioned, are we not, for world government. In fact, John Lennon sang about it in the song Imagine. I will not be singing that for you today. (laughs) But I'll just read it. Imagine a time where there are no countries, no religion, no heaven, no hell, no possessions, everyone living for today, and the world is one. Even in our music, education, preparation for this coming world government to be brought back into place in perfection following the rapture of the church. And then beyond that, the world will experience a one world religious system. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 7 says, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. The devil is already at work in the spiritual world. Because, you see, what is in today is not Christ. What is in today is not the Bible. What is in today is not solid doctrine. What is in today is the Oprah spirituality. Where people are seeking to fill a God-shaped vacuum in them, which only Christ can fill with artificial substitutes. And if you don't have Christ, the next best thing you can have is power, pleasure, and a form of godliness called spirituality, which denies the power therein. 1 John 4 and verse uh, verse 3 says, The spirit of the Antichrist is already in the world. Look at the condition of our churches today. How evangelical Christians, Bible-believing Christians, are believing things and doing things that prior generations thought were unimaginable. This crazy idea of Chrislam, where people think that you can actually merge Christianity and Islam together, which is sort of like mixing oil and water. And how even in Houston, there's a great big church out there. Have you noticed that on TV? They meet kind of in an ex-basketball facility. And how one of the leaders at this church gets up in front of the church for about 37 seconds. You can see it on YouTube. And she says very clearly that we are not here for God. We are here for ourselves. Because when we are happy, God is happy. I won't give you the identification of the church, but the last name of the pastor is Osteen. <laughs> but these are the type of things that are, that are happening today. Jesus spoke of, did he not, tares amongst the wheat. And can you imagine, if our churches are like this today, can you imagine what they will be like a moment or a second after the rapture when every true born-again believer is removed from these churches? Think how fast they will move into a one-world religious system, the great harlot that is described in Revelation 17. And then something else that will happen one second after the rapture, the world will be on the precipice of experiencing the greatest signs and wonders movement it has ever seen. 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2 and verse 9 says this, That is, the one whose coming is in accordance with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders. Do you want miracles and only miracles? That's coming, the Bible says, through the Antichrist. It's interesting that when you study these three terms in Greek, powers, signs, and wonders, these are the same words that show up in Christ's ministry. Except these are called false signs and wonders. Why are they called false or pseudo signs and wonders 
for this simple reason, they do not emanate from God. They emanate from the devil. Does God perform miracles? Absolutely. But he is not the only individual in the miracle working business. The devil has tremendous abilities to perform miracles. Not on the same level as God, of course, but imitations. Now, this chart here, I went through every verse of the Bible I could find. Where a miracle is transpiring and God is not the author of that miracle. It begins there in Exodus 7 and 8 where Pharaoh's magicians could imitate many of the miracles brought forth by God through Moses and Aaron. And you go right on through that list and you'll see what I call satanic miracles, signs, and wonders. And you see, the world today is being conditioned to believe that something is true if a miracle happens. Now, I am not against the miraculous. I pray constantly for God's direction and intervention. I pray for people to get well. But you see, a miracle in and of itself is not an automatic authentication of truth. There has to be an alignment of doctrine and lifestyle with the Word of God. The Word of God is the ultimate court of arbitration when determining something is real. But you see, people today really aren't looking at the Bible. They're looking to an experience of some kind. If you're into experiences, independent of what the Bible says, Satan will give you those experiences. In fact, Islam came to Gabriel not the Gabriel of the Bible, came to Muhammad, rather, through a false angel or demon named Gabriel. Mormonism came to the world through, to Joseph Smith through a false angel named Moroni. And you see, the devil gives these types of experiences and the world today, as it looks for an experience, is about to have experiences that it has never seen before one second after the rapture, once the Antichrist is unveiled. Revelation 13, verse 3, it says, I saw one of the heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed, and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. Revelation 13, 13 says, He performed great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. A signs and wonders movement is on the horizon. And if you're looking only for a signs and wonders movement, regardless of truth, Satan seeks to fill that need in people. And then something else will happen, I believe, is the demise, one second after the rapture, of the United States of America. People have puzzled about this for a long time. Why is the United States of America never mentioned in Bible prophecy? A lot of people try to find the United States of America in Bible prophecy. I had someone say, well, the words USA is in the, spelled out in the word Jerusalem. <laughs> it's probably about as close as you could come. But the United States of America is not there. People puzzle as to why. We can offer some conjecture. I think the reason that the United States of America is not present is because America is unique among the nations of the earth, not only in terms of its Judeo-Christian foundation, but also because most of the Christians in the world are living in the United States of America. The United States of America has the largest Christian, although it's waned in influence, the largest in, uh, population of Christians in this country than any other place on planet Earth. And you see, when you go to other countries, Christians are in a place of subservience, ditch diggers, ditch diggers, and things of that nature. In America, it's different. We have Christian leaders in industry, business. Occasionally, we get one or two in politics. We even get a Christian lawyer every once in a while. <laughs> and think about all of these people in these places of influence removed suddenly through the rapture. Think that what that would do to our economy. Think that what that would do to our leadership. If you doubt America was built on a Christian foundation, let me quote the United States Supreme Court. 
1892 in a case called the Church of the Holy Trinity versus the United States. This was a, not a 5-4 decision. This was a 9-zip decision, unanimous. And Justice David Josiah Brewer wrote the majority opinion, and at the end there he says, after citing 87 precedents, that's a lot of precedents, this is a Christian nation, 1892. And how the devil wants us to believe that this nation was not founded on a Christian base. It was founded by enlightenment or deism, but it just isn't true. There isn't a country in the world that's had a greater influence of Christianity than the United States of America. And think if that Christian influence was just immediately wiped out through the rapture. The rapid deterioration of America, which I think will lead to the great invasion spoken of in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Because you see, in Ezekiel 38 and 39, it mentions various nations that we can identify today invading the nation of Israel in the last days. And what is the counterbalancing force that prevents this invasion from occurring now? It is a Western power called the United States of America, which has, although it's slipping some in recent days, has been a faithful ally to the nation of Israel. In fact, the United States of America is probably the only real ally the nation of Israel has. And I don't really think Israel needs America. I think America needs Israel. Because Genesis 12, verse 3, God is very clear. I will bless those who bless you, Israel. I will curse those who curse you. And what makes me tremble is seeing these politicians move away from, in their rhetoric, our unconditional commitment to the nation of Israel. But yet, what if that nation that has this commitment to Israel didn't even exist or was decimated because of the rapture? You could quickly see this sudden invasion spoken of in Ezekiel 38 and 39. And the final thing that will happen is the world will be in a place where it will now be a candidate for the wrath of God. Life is hard now. We as Christians go through ordinary trials, the wrath of man, Satan's wrath, the world's wrath, but there is a wrath that is not being poured out right now, which is the wrath of God. In fact, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 9 puts it this way, For God has not destined us for wrath. Aren't you glad about that? We are not appointed unto wrath. Romans 2 and verse 5 describes this wrath being built up almost like water behind a dam. Romans 2 verse 5 says you are storing up Wrath for yourselves for the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. The wrath of God is being stored up. It's being built up behind this dam. And one of these days following the rapture of the church, that dam will break. And the wrath of God will be poured out upon this world in a way that makes suffering today looks so minor or minimal by comparison. We are not appointed unto wrath, yet the tribulation period, many verses there at the bottom that document that, is a time of divine wrath. You see, Jesus in heaven, Revelation 5, will begin to open the seven-sealed scroll. And as that scroll is opened, it will bring forth the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and the bold judgments. Three sets of seven. It's horrific what's described here in the book of Revelation. Even the seal judgments will bring forth the Antichrist, war, famine, death, martyrdoms, cosmic disturbances. The wrath of God, contrary to what many people teach, begins immediately once the tribulation period begins. Revelation 6 and verse 8 says this related to the fourth seal judgment. Over a fourth of the earth 
to kill with the sword. Think of a quarter of the world's population just disappearing. Now, if that weren't bad enough, you go to Revelation 9, verse 15, and it talks about the sixth trumpet. It says to kill a third of mankind. So if you have uh, four fingers on your hand, why don't you hold that up just for a second? Four fingers. And take down one finger. That would be the seal judgment, number four. Take down your middle finger. What's left? Just two fingers left. So between the quarter of the world's population being wiped out, then a third of what remains of the world's population being wiped out, half of the world's population is destroyed following the rapture of the church as the events of the tribulation period unfold. This is why Jesus said in Matthew 24, 21, for there will be great tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will again. Well, so what? Why does it really matter? A lot of people will say, you know, these things will never happen. Because they brought into a argument called uniformitarianism, which basically is the belief that everything that's happening today will always be. There will never be a dramatic change in God's program. And they mock preachers that talk about these things. And may I just say to you that if you're mocking these things, you are fulfilling prophecy. Because 2 Peter 3, verses 3 and 4 says, Know this, first of all, in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following their lust, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue just as it was from the beginning. You see, if you're a Bible student, this shouldn't shock you because God has already judged the world once through the flood. If he's already done it once, what's to stop him from doing it Again, number one, reject uniformitarianism. Number two, I don't have this on the screen, but live for Christ. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you know that any moment you're going to be taken into heaven and either given rewards or not given rewards, then we should be not in a state of compromise today. We should be living for Christ as never before. If there's some ongoing sin pattern in your life today, Bring that before the Lord and say, Lord, help me with this so that I can live for you and be your vessel in these last days. Beyond that, reach the lost. What is the fate of your unsaved family member, coworker, neighbor, if they're never a believer in the gospel, they are left behind to experience all of these things. And then finally, the last one, and with this I'm finished, believe the gospel. It could be that you're here today and you have never really believed the gospel. You've never trusted in the gospel. Why do we call it the gospel? The gospel is this. It's good news. It's good news because Jesus did it all in our place through his death, burial, and resurrection. We don't try to save ourselves. We trust in the one who came to the earth to save us. And you gain right standing before God by simply receiving what he has done for you as a free gift. It isn't something you can earn. If you're trying to earn it, you can't have it. You receive it only as a gift. And the way you receive a gift from God is by faith. For the Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith simply means trust, reliance, dependence, confidence. You're no longer trusting in yourself, your parents, your denomination. You're trusting exclusively in the promises of Jesus Christ for the safekeeping of your soul. That's something you can do right now as you're seated, as the Spirit of God places you under conviction. It's not something you have to raise a hand to do, walk an aisle to do, give money to do, join a church to do. It's a matter of privacy between you and the Lord or you trust in him and him alone for your salvation. And if that's something you are doing or have done, then on the authority of the word of God, you've just changed your eternal destiny. You are a candidate for the next great prophetic event in history, which is the rapture of the church. One second after the rapture, good things for the believer, tough times for the unbeliever. 
and how this should impact our lives. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we are grateful for this grand and glorious truth you've given us called the rapture of the church. Help this not to be just theories for us, but help it to have a real world implication and relevance regarding how we as your people are to live for you in these last days. We ask that your hand of blessing would be on this conference and the Spirit of God would use all of the different speakers to bring forth important things that we need to know. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said. Amen. This has been One Second After Rapture, presented by Andy Woods. To receive a free catalog of over 250 awesome Bible studies on DVD or CD, all using and defending a literal translation of the Bible, information on upcoming Bible conferences in your area, or details of our missionary outreach and trips to Israel, call Compass at 800-977-2177 24 hours a day, or visit us on the web at compass.org.